Bop it. Twist it. Pull it. Rock it. Rue it. <laughs> Sun it. <laughs> Chameleon it. No, that doesn't work. It's monosyllables. Rock it. All right. Yeah? Um, i getting used to not having to project so much anymore. Bless you. She's being so quiet. Mm. Should you, like, introduce me? Yeah. Welcome to another wonderful episode of Radio Free Golgotha. I am here, as always, with my benevolent co-host, Jesse Hathaway-Diaz. And, al- and we are also joined by the wonderful Mallory Vaudois. Thank you for coming all this way to our house. To, <laughs> Where to I also here. live. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is which is convenient, right? Very convenient. Yeah. Almost a little too convenient, mm-hmm. some might say. Some might. Well, Put a guest on the show, they say. <laughs> <laughs> Put some feelers out, they say. <laughs> it's not nepotism, we said. <laughs> so this week we are bringing you a very special episode, uh, which is um, for the Feast of San Rocco. Or Saint Rock, or Saint Roach, uh, as I have heard some people, I don't know, mispronounce. I guess. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, it is our also as uh, it is our first full guest appearance mm-hmm. by by someone, and it is it was kind of presaged by the fo- Night of Folk Necromancy. Yeah, which is available on the website and through YouTube, uh, which you can hear uh, all three of us talking together, like we actually are friends and get know each other well um which may or may not be the case um, <laughs> my fingers smell like garlic bread i think it's ashes oil okay i'm sorry anyway so the feast of saint rock uh august 16th august 17th depending on which part of catholicism you're in mm-hmm. and uh italy i'm sure has four thousand additional dates um <laughs> but uh so the feast of saint rock and uh plant wise we're talking about rue mm-hmm. yep and Stone mineral wise, we're talking about carnelian. Mm-hmm. Additionally, uh, the episode is brought to you by the sun, the <laughs> card, not the well. I guess the planetary body, but the card, the tarot trump. Right, the only arcana that actually like makes sense in terms of its astrological correspondence being the thing that's written on the card, um, and also by the demon Frucissier. And I'm never gonna be able to pronounce that ever. I mean, I just I just run at it basically. It's okay. like Janine Garofalo. It's more about knowing when to stop saying it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the Eshu uh, Eshu dos cemeterio mm-hmm. dos cemeterio, and the by asshole. the geomantic figure of Fortuna Minor, and its corresponding Odu Irosu. Mm-hmm. And um, talking a little bit about plague magic, hopefully, mm. uh, which is. Witches, yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Dead Magician is uh, an interesting extension of all this today. Uh, it's an experiment, but the four thieves mm-hmm. of the vinegar fame. Yeah. Um, so uh, extension of this, you can sense a theme. Um, but uh, thank you so much for for trying out the many experiments today. And thank you, Mallory, for coming. So mm-hmm. Thank you for having me, guys. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you for allowing me in your house again. <laughs> Okay, so uh, tradition has it that we talk about the saint first. Mm-hmm. So Saint Rock. Anybody want to take over the the official the official natures of what what his story is? Well, the line of most obvious kind of uh, correspondence between these things is plague, right? Mm-hmm. And immediately we run mainly into what uh, Saint Rock, as one of the first mentioned in the Golden Legend. Uh, reve- uh, revealed as um, I can't remember the exact word they used. It's it's a brilliant term, uh, but like getting rid of plague and pestilence specifically. But one of the things that interests me is where plague and famine kind of interrelate with each other, uh, mm. or or swap back and forth mm. uh, depending on what's going on. So, I mean, San Rocco. Uh, is an interesting one in terms of like his his origin story begins before he's born, mm-hmm. right? So his uh, his his very um, what's the word I'm looking for? Devout mother prays for uh, a child, right? They're, they're they're childless, and here's the voice of an angel 
uh, who then announces that she will she will have a kid, and he's so devout that he fasts when she fasts as well, even when he's a baby. He only feeds once a day, and he's said to be uh, gladder and merrier and sweeter than the other kids. And I like that as a starting point as well, that not just mm. like this kind of, um, what's the word they use for, for like, uh, particularly lady saints uh, who are like burning in a building or something, but are like utterly blank about it. Uh, the beatitude. Is that is that one is that the right word? Maybe. maybe. I just do it in this context. Right? Oh, no, maybe not. Uh, the 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 sense of like oh they're 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 enlightened and they're removed from the world and they're not like experiencing it. Whereas like he's actually not just like oh he didn't cry and he was so calm and had this aura of like right. the divine. Like the beatific mm-hmm. vision, the the visage. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. But he's he's actually like happy, and certainly speaking from like personal experience of. Um, the last couple of years going to the, the San Rocco um, parade in, uh, in New York uh, that's one of the, the senses that like he, he's uh, he seems I mean not to suggest that he's like you know some Father Christmas nothing but joviality but there seems like a real sense of like celebration and gladness there mm, yeah and it, it's one of the maybe actually the longest running uh, continuously celebrated Italian American feast in the United States, the Festa di San Rocco, which is held every year uh, by the San Rocco Society of Potenza in New York. And I see a lot more of the types of like old school devotions at that particular feast than I have seen at others in the same region. Uh, You see a lot more people who are carrying either the massive, um, they look like cakes made out of candles, but they're enormous. They're like the size of our coffee table and carrying them is a type of almost penance um, and something that you would undertake the same way that you would undertake, you know, any other type of corporal mortification in order to Uh, express your devotion through your body and through something which is painful and kind of stretches the limits of what you are comfortable sensing. You see also people with the large wax replicas of often legs because as we'll talk about later San Rocco does have a wound on his leg. It's one of the things that is often seen in his heraldry. And you even see a couple of people who will do the the procession barefoot, which as anybody who has ever been to New York knows is, uh, you know, you're really taking your own life in your hands <laughs> if you walk around barefoot in Manhattan. Um, that is a, a, you know, a little bit of a bridge too far for me right now, devotion wise. Maybe if I ever learned how to levitate, I would be willing <laughs> to do that. Um, but you know, these are really old school devotions that you don't see as often either uh, in the U.S. or back in Italy anymore. And I think it's really beautiful to see it there. And I think it's in part because San Rocco is such a, in my experience at least, very approachable saint and a saint that people really fall in love with when they're engaging with him. Um, and I think he he kind of in particular because he is associated so much with protection from disease and consequently uh, with healing, he tends to inspire that particular type of faith that can really only happen when you're faced with your own mortality or a loved one's mortality, and then you get into the bonus round, right? Like you you thought you were gonna die, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then you didn't. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's... uh kind of has a reputation of being the friendlier version of Lazarus mm. um, as far as beggar saint who's I mean he's a he's a he's not a beggar by by birth he was rich he's the son of a governor yeah. of yeah. Uh, I don't know how Italians pronounce French words but I'm you know, Montpellier <laughs> or Montpellier <laughs> they don't <laughs> um, but near the French border and on his he was 20 years old when his parents died and his father gave him the kingdom said you're now the governor and he basically did what francis did he took up all his clothes and marched into the wilderness gave up his possessions and became uh, uh an ascetic he also had a birthmark on his chest which was uh the shape of a cross which is comes up a lot in the lore and there's a lot of fake relics uh that you see of painted 
pig skin and things like that mm-hmm. to be like this is the birthmark it's like you rip the skin off the saint mm-hmm. and that's what we raise high the banner but um it's a, it's actually meant to increase in size as well i think yes. like the golden legend mentions as oh, well wow. yeah yeah so it's not just as he grows as he becomes more pious oh. as well as he goes around healing more people and um yeah exorcising plague and pestilence uh, which is interesting because it's um there's a lot of older lore in spanish culture about rock but it roque but it changes i think by the time you get to the states it is a far like he's a far less popular saint now amongst hispanic catholics hmm. than he used to be um certainly the there's i grew up going to uh the church in saint barbara that's dedicated to him uh santa barbara i just it's the english spanish hybrid there sorry uh santa barbara uh santa barbara there we go that's the la term um <laughs> it just can't combine languages it's difficult um, but also uh, New Orleans, the, the cemetery and the church that are there are very well loved mm. and uh, a very potent worked cemetery yeah. in a town that belongs to the dead already <laughs> and is saturated with an air of disease by the moisture and the heat um, mm. is, is such a thing. And, and, and just his feast day being in the dog days of August mm. of being so oppressive and literally oh, dog days. Oh, and he's a dog saint. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like those are related. It's almost like serious, the whole serious, con, you know, <laughs> conspiracy, you know. Okay. Um, and why is he a dog saint? What's the what's the role of the dog? It's to bring him food. Okay, okay. so he, he sets <laughs> off as an ascetic. Yeah, yeah. When, when last we left our hero, we'll get ahead. <laughs> he left Montpellier and was heading south towards Rome. And on his way, he encountered... Uh, several Italian communes that were, or, or villages that were beset by plague, as uh, Italy frequently was at the time. And he. It's because your people deserve to be punished. A that's, lot. that's really inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, we're, well, you know, we'll get to this when we talk about plague magic, but plague is a spiritual force. It is a yes. teacher, it, it leaves a mark. Um, and so. He begins to care for the sick, and this is obviously a very radical act, right? Because when a plague, when there's breakout of a plague, the the response, the natural response is to kind of ostracize anybody who has been infected, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like zombie movie style, to get as far away from them as possible and to cease caring for them, even though they can no longer care for themselves. And San Rocco was particularly attracted to that type of uh, charitable endeavor, caring for the people that nobody else would care for. Mm-hmm. Um, but eventually, perhaps inevitably, that meant that he contracted the plague himself. And at that point, he himself was actually ostracized from the community that he had been caring for. And so he went out into the wilderness to live in isolation and presumably to die in isolation. But uh, there, it said that he built a hut for himself and a spring miraculously appeared mm-hmm. next to the hut so he had fresh water and then this dog also showed up and started bringing him bread, I think. Um, so he had fresh water and he had food uh, and the dog was also said to uh, trigger warning to anybody who's not into really gross stuff um, to lick his plague sores clean and that, that action of eating the pus or, or whatever it is that comes out of plague source um, was what healed him. Uh, and you, you find this with other saints as well, um, like uh, Saint Marie à la Coque, who was uh, a French nun, I think, who is kind of responsible for propagating devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That was one of the forms of penitence that she would take upon herself when she was caring for the sick. She'd actually eat their um, effluvia. I don't know. Anything that came out of them, she'd eat it. Mm. Um, So She's a sin eater. A sin eater, yeah. Yeah. Um, And so that's where the dog kind of comes into it. Which I find interesting. Again, he's... uh... He fasts as a kid, and he fasts when he's like a teenager, and the dog brings him food, and there is this exchange that we hinted at earlier between mainly known in the law for warding plague, 
but turning up in specific instances of, of his celebration uh, that you've come across, right, love? Uh, where there's some interchange with him being appealed to in times of famine as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think in southern Italy in particular, all saints need to be able to do plague and they need to be able to do famine. That's kind of like the basic job requirements. Um, and so in my, one of my, my, my maternal grandfather's hometown, uh, the Feast of San Rocco is more associated with harvest imagery and uh, consequently with kind of like the fertility of the fields and ensuring a good harvest than he is with plague. And I think that these are actually rather natural corollaries to one another because when you think about it, one of the sources of famine is uh, blight on the crops. So like a disease that affects the crops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the flip side of that is if you live in an agricultural community that suffers from plague, you run the risk of incurring a labor shortage. And so when it comes time to tend the fields or to uh, harvest what has been growing, if you don't have enough people, if you don't have enough labor, there's the risk that you, even those who have survived, whatever the disease was once it has passed, will die of starvation mm. because you don't have the option of delaying agriculture. It needs to happen according to its own rhythm and you, you can't afford to be late. You don't get to push that deadline back. Right. I think it's also helpful to look at the, the, the cosmology or cosmovision that, that encapsulates what these are. They are both names for a similar impulse, which is, uh, on a polite way, a teaching moment from God to be like, your community needs to band together, you need to do these things. And, and, and Rock is often viewed as a saint that is that of like you know your illness can to it was romanticized his illness that he uh suffered an illness in order to be closer or to to uh have greater sympathy with the wound the the, the suffering of christ mm -hmm. and it's one of those things that it's a fine line between saying like you're sick and you deserve it because you're god is punishing you mm -hmm. versus spinning that around and having it be like I can get this is this is a teaching moment for me what can I do how can I turn this moment of depletion and attack on me into something that nourishes me into something that nourishes my spirit yeah and ultimately I come out the other side because the the, the, the strange thing with st. Brock in addition yes he overcame the plague and he gets this patronage from this guy who or he becomes his acolyte and he returns back to his hometown and is promptly thrown in prison mm -hmm. where he withers away for five years and then dies mm. and only upon his deathbed do they realize that's the guy with the giant cross on his chest and oh my god he's the governor of our town yeah. and uh let's make him a saint right now um so it wasn't there is a little bit of that kind of hopefulness that that comes in with saints many times of like never losing hope which mm. is important and there's an anchoring in there but i find the debate around the plague saints themselves and and rocco being such a plague saint of his birth and death in actuality probably being close to 50 to 100 years after when we say he was but so he actually died right around the start of the great plague coming in um as opposed to 100 years before but it, it it's mm -hmm. interesting how it's like is it because of the the communal worship and him being named a saint by mm -hmm. the people um and then later uh, celebrated through the church as well i don't know it's uh his story is kind of hard for me in that way of like doing all these things, doing good work, and then it's not the happy ending. It's not the Disney version of Christianity mm -hmm. that is, you know, sold in CCD sometimes of, like, just get through it and God will reward you. Like, okay. Yeah. Mm. He's, he's a happy saint, mm. but, man, it's a, it was it, a hard end of his life. It's kind of the opposite of the prosperity gospel when you think about it because he <laughs> starts out rich. He's the son of a governor. He has a lot of temporal power, and instead he chooses uh, plague and death. Yep. And, and fasting along the way and all of these, you know, kind of mortifications. Um, but you're, I, I think it's interesting what you just brought up, Jesse, about the fact that he lived in, I think, the 14th century and he wasn't officially canonized until the 17th century. Yeah. And 
at the same time, he was canonized because he was so popular. So yeah. he, even though now he is about as official and vouched for as any saint in the Catholic canon, he really did start with this groundswell of grassroots support. Mm -hmm. And that was maintained for several, maintained for several hundred years without any kind of uh, official recognition. Yeah, folks ate first and merging into something larger because they could verify the historicity of it. I also find the argument that he is an inheritor of a previous saint, Rock, that was in the ninth century who was also invoked for plague and hmm. famine. Hmm. And so because of name, a different feast day, there's some that believe that um, St. Roch of Montpellier, Mont Montpellier, oh, foreign words, um, which was often in Montpellier celebrated in January, his feast day, and that August became, was always associated with this other St. Roch, and the two became merged, as often happens in popular Catholicism, yeah. of two things with the same name, you can argue that there's two St. Lazaruses, but you tell any practicing Catholic that in the last 400 years, they're like, why? You can argue that Mary Magdalene is not the sister of Lazarus and Martha, but there's churches dedicated to them as a family. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it becomes this thing of uh, the little kid shaking their finger of like, but that's not the case. And you're like, well, divine revelation, and mm -hmm. um, it seems to be working just fine. So mm -hmm. fuck off. And now he's accompanied by another folk saint. Yes. Which is St. Guinefort. The dog saint. The literal dog saint. It's a, it's, this is the name of the dog that he is commonly depicted with, who uh, was bringing him food so that he could survive when he was uh, suffering from his illness and sequestered in, in the wilderness. Uh, and St. Guineford, how about that? Uh, it's, it's remarkable because there, there seems to be a, sh a shortage of animal saints. Um, there is some, the only parallel that I know of, uh, right off the top of my head, is the, the lion that uh, came and helped bury St. Mary of Egypt mm -hmm. in some traditions is considered a saint hmm. um, huh. because she had fed the lion communion and therefore he was awakened to true lion nature um, and eschewed the flesh after that. He's a vegetarian lion. Um, but St. Guinefort is, uh, in some stories, but not necessarily in the areas that revere him as a saint by himself, um, uh, sometimes said to be a greyhound, but um, that he was able, he somehow was a priest dog that was like next to the priest during the laying on of hands. There's all these lovely heretical Oh, things. like a master splinter style so thing. So the, the dog what? is able to convert bread into the host, which is why it was this mm -hmm. extra side benefit to St. Rock because he was able to receive communion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore the dog in stealing bread for him, his holiness... Mm -hmm. um, his 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 canonity um, makes it spiritually nourishing as well. Mm -hmm. Wow! Um, and in addition to the, the the sheer overlap with Saint Lazarus imagery of dogs and plague and beggar mendicant, um, bad legs. Uh, uh, well, bad legs, but like Saint Rock, as we said earlier, and as I've said many times, that man has some beautiful legs in his in his imagery and it borders on idolatry at that point <laughs> but um some beautiful well even the tradition of ex voto right and having as you said the the, the raising of the leg um just totally like game of thrones banners there um but uh to have wax or metal or wood or even drawings of the body parts that are healed which it also mm. overlaps into uh saint heraldry itself mm. that if you do have a leg injury and even if it's not plague related San Roque becomes a possibility because of the association with his leg. Yeah. Um, similar to stigmatics can be used for your hands, whether or not you're actually suffering from the wounds of Christ, you know, on your day off. So, It's an interesting parallel as well with uh, St. Peregrine in terms of, an, I mean, obviously the, the iconography of like another... Who is not a falcon. Right. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Give it a hundred years. Yes. <laughs> Start soaring off the Not heads. with that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Not with that attitude. Uh, he is also showing off a leg wound. And this idea of saints associated with plague also having this element of travel to them, this kind of itinerancy, if we like, or 
you know, a peripatetic nature of like going from place to place, being the stranger that turns up in town and, and, and fixes things in some way, mm. and then, you know, rides off into the sunset. And the nature of contagion being one of like uh, spreading and of uh, affecting things next to things. Mm. And it, it's also interesting to look at which saints are allowed to show physical deformity. Um, I was thinking about this today because I, I went to the parish that's near my office uh, to say hello to the statue of San Rocco that they have there and um, to just kind of pray for his inspiration for this podcast. Um, but It's pronounced Poodcast. Poodcast, yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in Basque? Yes, uh, just, you know, in, in, in Bronx English is yeah. how we say it. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and so in, one of the things that really struck me was that there's – a lot of saints there, there's uh, Santa Lucia, St. Lucy, there's St. Bartholomew, and these saints are depicted with either, you know, heraldic recognition of injuries that they suffered in life. Um, so St. Lucy is holding the eyes that, you know, she's said to have been plucked out of her, out of her head. Um, either, but she still got him. But she still got him, <laughs> and you know she she doesn't have these gaping bloody holes in her face. She has her lovely beautiful eyes, and then also eyes on a plate. And likewise, Saint Bartholomew, who's said to have been flayed alive, he is carrying his skin, but he's not you know a body's exhibit mm. in the church. Mm -hmm. He appears uh, completely whole and and uh, in no way injured. Um, and I, I think that there's probably other examples of this as well. Um, but then San Rocco is permitted, I guess, in a way to reflect mortality and reflect the fact that even the saints, uh, having lived exemplary lives before God, were mortal, fallible, and even though they're kicking around now, they did die one day. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that is uh, its own kind of profound mystery. There's... There is a really famous statue of St. Bart in muscular form holding his own skin. It's a, a stone carving. That's, oh, that must scare so many children yeah, yeah. going to church. <laughs> when I saw it, I was just like, oh, God, that's so gorgeous. Because it's also interesting because of, of his relationship to uh, serpent cults around mm -hmm. wherever there's a serpent deity. It's like St. Bart finds his way in because he's holding his own skin. Mm -hmm. And St. Lucy, you do see um, small girl dolls with a crown of thorns dressed in First Communion mm. uh, outfits with the bloody eye sockets, the dolls that are sold in Mexico City as Lucias, um, mm. Lucias that, that uh, are to bring vision for the future person, especially if they're going through these things. So That's there is the depiction, but in the church itself, that the, the beatific vision, that it's the saint in heaven, mm -hmm. they're showing you who they are through their heraldry, but it could be anything. You yeah. know, it, it's just a way of like a marking it. And, and St. Rock also, where <clears throat> the the instrument of their death is so small in a saint's actual life, but they often get known for it. Whereas St. Rock was so inextricably linked to plague. Yeah. And it wasn't the thing that killed him necessarily. It was starving away in a prison in his own hometown and, and have, being too modest and yeah. humble to say like, by the way, I'm home. <laughs> um, and, and what that is. And the, it reminds me of the, cause the, there is a syncretism with St. Rock in, uh, Cuban Arisha in, in Lukumi of with Oke, um, who's the divine mountain who lives with Obatala. Mm. And I, I always think that this is partially a joke because Saint Rock is Oke is also the largest rock that you is in your in the collection, let's say. Um, and Oke is the, the mountain where Obatala first stepped down and uh, it means mountain or hill in any large uh, any large stone. But Obatala was also a, a a figure since Oke is so linked to Obatala that Obatala was thrown in his own son's dungeon uh, mm -hmm. when traveling and uh, part of it from just not listening to advice of like you have to change into white cloth constantly so that people will recognize you because Eshu is going to come and throw palm oil on you which he didn't predict at the time but he only had a certain number of changes costume changes to mm -hmm. make sure that people knew that the king of the white cloth was still in white and so Shango's kingdom goes to plague and famine Mm. And uh, they ask why, and it's because there's somebody in your dungeon who goes down there and realizes his own, his own father is there. Mm. Um, which is an interesting thing, again, dealing with plague and famine and being thrown in jail and what that is. And the notion of when you are sick and when you are not, a, a, a terminally sick, not the right, uh, uh, continually sick, when you're living with a mm. disease, 
the idea of the body becoming its own prison, that mm. you are behind the bars of your own body. This is your body has betrayed you, you feel you feel betrayed. And the question of why me, what is this? Um, I would imagine has to arise and it seems to be part of the the natural processing of any diagnosis that is that long lasting. Mm -hmm. um, and playing in that time period, which is there's no cure. You're you're going to die. It is still a very difficult disease. Um, it was something that uh, uh, was talked about at the last VGS. I'll footnote him. He's a his article is amazing. Um, but talking about it, it's still a scary disease. And mm -hmm. just because it's mostly gone does not mean that its uh, its relevance is is erased. But also the transference of plague in modern cultic practice heavily to HIV is mm -hmm. a huge thing. The plague saints are now HIV saints. And because plague has been mostly erased, it is now a, a diversion. And the concept of a plague saint as a category as to what it is which kind of goes into plague magic in that way, but that there were people that commissioned paintings and tapestries of a plague saint who was often a patron saint of the town or a new saint, like let's take a chance, and commissioned that saint with all of the family painted in the portrait, mm. interceding between God, mm. and so that the so that the saint, in some ways, becomes uh, the scapegoat in the sense of like let's let's they will take our suffering on for us because they can handle it because they're saints, which also brought in in many areas like I know Spain, France, and I believe Northern Italy for sure. Um, I don't know Southern Italy because I'm not going to pretend to know Southern Italy at all with you in the room, or I'll be upset and scared, um, but. The idea that a plague saint also could have been quote unquote demons coming in and receiving the worship of a town to try and pretend that they it will save them from the plague. Mm. So you have plague saints and you have plague devils traditions arising, mm. which is very interesting. So, like so I, they're running a kind of protection racket. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, and you know, it's the the Saint Rosalia side of it of like, you know, go find my bones in the in the in the cave and and you will be okay and and Palermo will be safe. And it's like. Well, I found these goat bones, and like, exactly. doesn't matter that goats are a satanic animal. It's okay. And they were right where I told you they but, would be. Exactly. And that is the, that's the moral of the story. Yes. Listen to me. Listen to Rosalia. Exactly. Which is apparently how you pronounce it. Yes. So the Spaniard in me is like, Rosalia is going to be so much easier. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say on St. Roque or let things come up as they will? Because I feel like Plague Magic is an easy segue. Segway, yeah. 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 I think we just started it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Plague Saints, Plague Devils, and so Plague Magic as a type of magic. Um, are we wishing people the plague? Are we preventing the plague? Depends on the day, really. <laughs> yeah, and the people. That's true. Define people, define plague, define magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, it becomes a stand-in or a metonym, if we like, for... Contagion in general, right? Which itself is a way of approaching a certain methodology of magic or a certain mechanism by which it is thought to work for a start. So plague itself is uh, demonstrative of a whole bunch of other things and so is both a very broad category and also incredibly specific. But in general, you know, most things that I think would be first springing to mind if we're looking at plague magic are how to ward it off in various ways mm -hmm. and most of those if we're going to look for a, an obvious through line are about replacing miasmas and bad airs with good mm -hmm. so uh, Cardinal Wolsey in the 16th and uh, 17th centuries is known for carrying a uh, orange I believe um, and that this is a testament to um, his ability to ward off uh, plague. He would carry an orange, uh, quote, deprived of its contents and filled with a sponge, which had been soaked in vinegar, impregnated with various spices, in order to preserve himself from infection when passing through the crowds, which his splendor or office attracted. Mm. Right. So this notion of having to protect the the senior cardinal or, or important person from, from the oi polloi, Right, so we have this this layer of, uh, of of protecting the the sacred person, and it makes me think of the incorruptibility of saints in general as well, actually, mm -hmm. and the idea of sweet odors overcoming uh, bad ones, mm -hmm. and that this itself is part of that whole uh, morphology of odor, 
uh, which I know, you know, is not the be all and end all of a of a good magical oil, mm-hmm. uh, but that something that smells bad isn't just unpleasant because it smells bad. It, it is it is narrating itself mm-hmm. in that doctrine of signature, in that morphology of scent. It is telling you that there's something bad about it. I would argue no. <laughs> I would argue that good smell means good, mm-hmm. but bad smell is the average everyday occurrence. For thousands of years, mm. unbathed people that never bathe, mm. meat cannot be kept except to be open air and hung and salted and dried. Rot happens, bodies are not taken care of unless they are paid for to be taken care of. Mm. So bad smells are part of everyday life, which the devil owns the earth until Jesus is, I mean, death owns the earth until Jesus is coming the second time. Right. But death and disease sharing that in the sense that bad can mean, but bad is every day. Mm. Bad, especially during the plague. With mm-hmm. boobos that actually open up and reek. Mm-hmm. Um, say your name. Reek. Um, but that, that's a totally free. I just I think that the, the good smells are good. That the, the bad smells could be... Well, bad happy. smells are also used to ward things off as well. The, well. Yes. Right? And, and, uh, like well, not sulfur even... Sulfur is a strong smell, but is awful. Awful? Yes is also used not only to ward, but also to invoke bad things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. Can, which brings up an interesting point with plague things, because it was we were talking about it talking about with Jeremy Bacelli, uh over when was the last VGS. Mm-hmm. So um, he is a specialist in contagious disease mm. and a, a magician and, and wonderful to talk to, uh, was showing many pomander balls that uh, mm. also have the kind of fake orange slices that opened up. So mm-hmm. they're beautiful things of like labeled in German oftentimes of each spice that went in it. Mm-hmm. And so you could decide which one you, but you would fill those up and then together there would be this wonderful thing to carry with you as mm-hmm. well as full on uh, oranges studded with different uh, things there. Um, but the the modern interpretation of things is often that the one that gives it can also take it away. But I think that we can argue for a different cosmology, which is that there's a magnetism to contagion. If you look at uh, plague deities, India, Africa, if you look at uh, Babaluaye Shokwana of, of, he is contagion. Mm. And he's the deified contagion. So he's not disease itself, but he is. Mm. And if he passes by once and we're sloppy with our um, etiquette, with our uh, physic, with our house, with, with all these things, disease can take root. If he passes by again when we're diseased, he could also, the magnetism of it goes back to him. So it's right. less about reward and punishment mm-hmm. and more about understanding the principles of these energies that are around, which is interesting. And, and why, why does one village get passed by completely mm. and another village decimated? And we know that one to two thirds of everybody just gone is, is pretty impressive. There's three of us now. One or two of us is dead in Black Plague years mm-hmm. uh, on average. And I think that's interesting too, the idea of it not being reward or punishment, especially with the St. Rocco spin hmm. of like, how does this, how is this? Like, what can I take from this lesson of sickness? Well, the, that's a, it's a great point in terms of, you know, do we mean warding off or do we mean sending? Yes. <laughs> the best example I can give of an anti-plague medallion is the Paracelsus Zenexton, which is full of horrible plaguey things. It's full of things that are considered... Uh, hateful and that hate humans like dried toad uh, we come back to how hateful toads are again sorry toad lovers uh, along with and this will hopefully come up later with uh, carnelian and a couple other things menstrual blood the worst substance in the world yeah. according to patriarchy and it's full of these things and it, it's uh, it's a it's a hollow medallion so it's stamped like a an astrological sigil would be at particular times full of this paste made of all these horrible things and it's a magnet for um, for bad stuff but it's a magnet that you carry around with you mm-hmm. so it's not hung somewhere and we hope that we transfer the plague over there and then don't go there we actively carry it around which you know I'm sure we've talked about this with the the Nazar as well, if I'm saying that anyway, right? The the blue and white and dark blue or black uh, evil eye charm, mm-hmm. right? Or ward. The mm-hmm. fact that it's actually eye shaped because it's absorbing the evil eye. It's taking that, you know, it's 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 um, Kevin Costnering in front of the bullet for you, right? Um, <laughs> it was Costner in in the Bodyguard. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
it's it's your astral bodyguard, and 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 so that's why you know some folks say that they should be periodically washed and, and soaked, not because they run out of power, but because they they're a, it's a it's it's flypaper, it's mm-hmm. attracting that stuff, and that's um, definitely the case with the with the Zenic stone. It's powerful because it it has a sympathy. Mm-hmm. No belief in the onion. The you see a lot. It still goes around in memes, but that if you cut an onion and leave it open to the air that it will be covered in flu and cold viruses the next day that it absorbs disease mm. which think about the fiery watery nature of an onion it's it's malodorous smell but still not terrible mm. and uh, interestingly in, in in Orisha worship of using a red onion in black beans uh, to represent the the family of Babaduwe and the plague the, mm. the disease deities that are the, the earth deities in that way mm. which is also plague is punishment in some way of the earth and which can relate it to famine that like uh, one of the, the hallmarks of Babadwe being his name meaning father of the world that when he is upset that he pushes the grains of the earth through your skin that that is why popcorn is sacred to him is because it looks like smallpox it's being it's the it's beans and things being pushed through your skin to show a connection to him mm. which automatically connects plague and famine. famine. Is that the root of trypidophobia? <laughs> I think that people are afraid of like circles too close together because Maybe. they're afraid of the things that are going to come out of them. Yeah, it's certainly the, the lotus pods and the Suriname toads. Yeah. Do they hate us as much? They might. What devils Probably. are in their skin? Yeah. Probably. Certainly the idea of what is the idea of uh, uh, bumps moving around under the skin. Uh, 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 well, uh, in, in terms of possession, uh-huh. so not just like what you void, you know, vomiting pins and stuff, but the, the European history of demonic possession is very much about often likening it to uh, rats uh, running up and down behind curtains, and this idea of what is unknown in the body coming out mm. or, 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 or showing itself but still there, you know, as a mm. distinction from opening up and something like being expressed out, which is, of course, also where we get. Um, not just the evil eye, but all notion of the contagious nature of passions themselves, mm-hmm. that they are expressed, an expression. You know, it's not just the eyes being the window of the soul. Mm-hmm. It's the, 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 the image of uh, the face of anger is like, um, like the principle of correspondence or the principle of names or whatever you want to call it. it, it the image of that thing it has the power of that thing and is thus, thus transmitted as well. Or um, if you want to put it, in a different way from expansion, it's it's multiplying itself. It's a virus that uh, attaches in and converts those well, cells to, to producing itself. Magic principle-wise, then, I want to know if the things that you can carry around in your body that are collecting disease or the, the evil eye charms, can I have it collected in my house, collecting things for a very long time, and then wash those off onto somebody else? Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, what's the possibility of, of that? Um, because mm-hmm. I mean, this is certainly a principle in in, in uh, transference cleansings. Mm-hmm. Like you, you don't touch the thing that was cleansed off the person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In in times where uh, animals are used, you don't eat the animal that was clean that was used for a cleansing. You can give it to people you don't know, but certainly no one in your family should be eating it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what those are, or uh, plants are often broken after they're passed over the body in sweepings in Latin American uh, healing traditions of like this is not to be used by anybody else again let me show you like we're breaking not only the tie to the person and the contagion but the disease the idea that if you clean off with foods to avoid different illnesses that you shouldn't eat that food for a day or so to to not bring that thing back to you yeah or to throw it at something that can take it throw the egg at the tree or drop whatever you used into running water Mm -hmm. to to give it back to something that has the capacity to remove the illness and, and hopefully neutralize it mm-hmm. if it's strong enough. Take it back to its rightful owner mm. of the days and disease, <laughs> the, the wild woods and what those mm, are. Yeah. The um, egg is especially interesting because it requires breaking it to tests that it's, to, to read it, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just a transference, it's also a diagnostic, right? It can be. It can be. Some eggs you don't want to break. Mm. Like, like, Yes, with inquiramorismo, you, you, some of them, if you're going to do a general diagnosis, you might do several egg claims, but the first one, yes, you have to break that. But the last ones, you throw those into the toilet and flush them as quickly as you can. Like, mm-hmm. you don't want to look at them, you don't want to see the devil that's contained in them. Mm-hmm. You just brush the person off and, and use perhaps one of our, our other guest stars of Rue 
uh, to to the bitterness of fully expurging mm. all those things out. Um, so yeah, it can. But diagnosis, I would diagnosis is different from full off cleansing. Like I do, you don't always rip the chicken apart to read its liver after you've mm -hmm. cleaned somebody with it. Mm. Sometimes just let that. Which by account and and having seen them done in various traditions, organs often liquefy when someone is really really sick and is clean with the animal, which is you know hugely disturbing um, mm. to see. Uh, Rue is a uh, interesting in terms of it being an irritant, right? It causes. Uh, it can cause skin rashes and things like that, right? And so is there a sense there, do you think, of it having the the power to do that thing and thus affect other things that... Um... Maybe, I mean, what is it? It's like one out of three to two out of three, depending on the area, have contact dermatitis issue with rue. So yeah, it mm -hmm. causes raised welts and things like this. There's some a belief by many that it's actually a substitute for Syrian rue, which it looks like, mm. um, and that it was a... A east moving west thing that there was a, a native ruta that, that looked like this in that way but I think uh, in the substitute way it seems to substitute very happily for many other plants and I'm, I know you have tons of lore of, of this so I'm going to let you uh, yeah thanks for raising the expectations really high for my <laughs> I said episode. I didn't say it was good lore I just said okay. tons of lore Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> abundance can be disease as well yeah, indeed that was, indeed. Cop, that was the Kappa Draconis thing right the yes to everything is not always necessarily good right but no uh no we, I've heard you talk wonderful things about uh Rue so just take it away so I don't have to keep talking yeah thank you thanks <laughs> thanks Jesse that was a great segue um, well, <laughs> why, why don't we start with the name right because the herb Rue is not etymologically related to the English language word rue, as in the verb meaning to regret. Um, rue or, the day. Yeah, to rue the day, uh, to rue one's actions. Hmm. Um, the, that, the, the verb comes from a Germanic root, meaning to, I think, to feel contrite. Um, but the word rue, as in the herb, uh, comes from Greek via Latin, um, and I don't speak Greek, but uh, the way that it is spelled here, it looks like Rio, um, which uh, Maud Greaves at least has as to set free, um, mm. which I think is really beautiful and really ties into what we were just talking about in terms of setting the illness free back in the, you know, the hall of its master, mm -hmm. um, back into the wilderness, back away from... Wishing the demon back into its proper oasis. Exactly. Go about your business somewhere else. Exactly. You, you trap <laughs> the bug and then you let it go outside rather than trying to kill it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's... <laughs> you don't want its family coming back to get you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or you don't want it to be carrying eggs. Um, I, I wish I didn't even make that comment because it's already filling my mind with these, like, visions. Smash the cockroach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank save, the, you. save the cockroach, save the world. I am never coming back on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Not voluntarily. Anyway. Um, so, but we... we it has a, a very... Uh, a, a lot of a reputation as being a very strong protective herb. Uh, and an herb which is used uh, specifically against disease, which is part of the reason why we were interested in uh, talking about it on this show. Um, and so I've heard it said uh, that it can be employed in disease, against diseases of cattle. Um, and also this was really interesting to me given the story that we just went through of, of San Rocco, but that um, there was a, you know, a time when judges uh, you know, in, in court would take sprigs of rue and place them uh, beneath the bench where they were sitting because uh, prisoners in jail uh, were particularly likely um, to be carrying infectious diseases. You know, jails not being very sanitary conditions. You have people who are kind of crammed in and not being, um, you know, taken care of properly. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who knows why they turn to that life of crime anyway, chances are. The, their life wasn't that great to begin with. Um, and so Rue was specifically used by judges to ward off um, the, the types of diseases that were carried by prisoners when they were brought into court. Hmm. It's also one of the ingredients in the famed Four Thieves vinegar that we'll talk about uh, later in the show. Um, but one of my 
favorite, favorite, favorite references to Rue is in a Neapolitan charm called the Chimaruta, which uh, comes from Chimadiruta, meaning a sprig of Rue. Um, and I, for the longest time, I wasn't sure whether this was a legit thing or not, because I was seeing it come up more often in English language sources uh, than I had ever seen it referenced in uh, Italian language sources. And I even asked my Neapolitan teacher, Anna Scornemilio, who's, uh, you know, very steeped in the, the customs of Naples and the folk culture of Naples about it, and she had never heard of it. <laughs> um, but recently I found a couple of interesting references to it um, in a, a book such as The Evil Eye by Frederick Thomas Elworthy, which was printed in 1895. Um, and uh, I've also seen several examples both in, uh, in the historical texts and also a couple of um, collectors on Facebook showing off their Chimaruta collections hmm. um, and, and primarily vintage and antique Chimarutas, which now has led me to believe that this might have been a much more common and popular charm in Naples in uh, maybe the 19th century which would explain why it is found so often in Italian American folklore and less often um, in the in the home country is because that was when the you know some of the strongest waves of immigration were happening um, but the Chimaruta charm is uh, it is silver usually and uh, there's some hypotheses that it may be uh, consequently lunar or associated uh, with the triple goddess because usually it's a sprig of rue that has three main branches um, so there could be some kind of connection to uh, the idea of uh, Hecate or other triple goddesses, you know, powerful in both heaven, earth, and hell. Mm. Um, and given, I, I think in the PGM, uh, the titles of Selene in heaven and uh, Artemis or Diana on earth and then Persephone in hell. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some triple goddess vibes. And in addition to the shape of the rube sprig itself, it often has... Uh, other charms that are almost growing out of it. Um, so often a key, very often a key, which again is kind of a, a Hecatean symbol, um, and a heart, uh, a moon. I think the crescent moon is probably the most popular after the key, and so again, the lunar symbolism. Hmm. Um, but I'm super interested right now in actually trying to make one of these with fresh rue um, and to, you know, bind a sprig of rue with like. Uh, you know, a skeleton key and maybe like a, a little crescent moon. Um, so maybe if some of your listeners want to try that too and report back, I'd, I'd love to hear how it works. Yeah. Um, but they're really, really beautiful. Mm. I think um, the charms themselves is the use of wearing rue. Okay, we're talking judges and, and the sprig of rue as a charm. Um, the In Brazil, the Maida Santo, they wear them behind the ears. So it's very common to wear rue in that way. It's one of the most common things we'll see. So if someone sees a plant behind the ear, it's most likely going to be rue. Um, uh, herb of grace, um, over the grass. So the, uh, in addition to warding off evil eye and protecting the things that you're hearing, mm. the mm. right influences, and the differences between wearing it on the right versus the left, um, as well as the beliefs that those of us in, in grew up around the Pumi of, of you do not take rue into people's houses because if they are a Polero, that there were things that, that was a no-no in some lines, some languages wow. of Apollo. It gets rid of the, the dead. So what's interesting as a Mexican-American family involved with Orisha, it's different because rue is one of the main herbs associated with Santisma Muerte because of its cleansing power. And it also highlights the difference between death and the dead. Mm -hmm. The two are not the same. The, the, one, the dead are the victims of death, or the children of death, mm -hmm. which is not the same as uh, death herself, mm -hmm. itself, uh, in Spanish it's female. But the, that notion of it as well is interesting, that it, it, it is used as a primary cleansing herb, especially with rosemary in Mexico, mm -hmm. um, and while copal is burning. So these two herbs mixed with the, the, those of the gray hair, as go, or white hair, as Gopal is called, mm -hmm. um, the wispy white smoke that comes from it, that rue and rosemary fulfill most, let's say two-thirds of sicknesses can be cleansed away by the, those herbs. Hmm. They're just that strong. 
together, hmm. um, and that they are used for lingas constantly because of that. Um, Those are both ingredients in uh, many formularies for Forthy's vinegar. Yeah. Um, planetarily speaking, that's interesting in terms of rue often being saturnine mm -hmm. and rosemary most often being solar. And so again, we've got the idea of that which rules disease mm -hmm. and also that which like wards it off and is the, the grand potable gold panacea. Well, it's true because the sun rules disease itself. It's Apollo and the plague god. Right. The, uh, the arrows that shoot from afar. And, and also, if we go back to St. Rock imagery of like oftentimes depicted with St. Sebastian mm. as fellow plague saints um, with the Virgin Mary trying to suckle and nurture people in times of this famine plague outbreak. Which itself is a back tribution. Right, he's he's associated it with arrows, and because arrows and the resurgence, uh, I think Renaissance era mm -hmm. of uh, an interest in those pagan gods and looking back at Apollo, like it it, it it's added in afterwards that like that's the that's the connection back because he's he's an athlete and so he's about like Sebastian mm -hmm. being about like good good health, mm -hmm. I guess in that term vigor and strength and also that he's. You know, beaten. He pulls a bit of a Rasputin, right? They try and kill him a couple times, and he just won't die. Yep. So there's that like um, perseverance, That's endurance, and stuff. For our podcast with there we go. Yeah, mm. and so that idea. Episode two. Oops, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It was it was an early one for sure, but the yeah the notion of like tying it back to and not just Apollo, like Refesh and a variety of other like you know, gods of the burning plague, uh, also being far darting or. Um, um, yeah, far shooting. Well, you bring up an interesting concept for me of like, certainly not if if Sebastian was a historical person, he wasn't thinking about his relevance to disease from arrows. Mm -hmm. But the mention of arrow as anything being allegory, period, the minute it becomes referenced, if he's holding an arrow, mm -hmm. there's a different gaze upon that. So it's not even necessarily. I mean, we can go back and say the relationship to play gods, but. Um, the, the notion of Sebastiana in New Mexico being the, the image of, of, of death, mm -hmm. that she who works from afar, and that the, the, the Aztecs, for instance, uh, part of worship of any deity was to shoot arrows at it, mm -hmm. and to, to call it, to stir it from its heaven from far away, and to, to, to rouse it up, and then we had to get rid of it afterwards, because like, there was almost the, the notion of bringing it into presence around us, and then being like, okay, now we have to get rid of it, because it's mm -hmm. excess of anything is bad. Uh, or, you know, it's like they say you have to, if you're going to shoot a bear, you better get it in one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you shoot at something, if you don't take it down, it's going to come right towards you. I, totally ironically. true for the video game I'm playing right now. Um, you come for the king, you best not miss. Yeah, hit it in the eye or you're screwed. Mm. Um, mm. Cyclops. Um, do we get that with, speaking of holding arrows, do we get that with your girl Ursula? Is she uh, appealed to in terms of In play? Mexico, yes. Yeah. First, for uh, like cholera specifically, hmm. um, also because of horrible, horrible folk prayers you find of like the eleven thousand virgins, meaning your daughters are replaceable. Like, bring me more daughters because mine are dying, mm. and it's like, wow. don't heal my daughters. <laughs> but like, just there's going to be more. Um, wow. But she's also tied to uh, impotence heavily, as the the witchcraft using her that you can reverse her image, hmm. and the arrow, arrow goes down because she is a, a woman holding the phallic arrow, hmm. and therefore can stop disease, stop STDs. Um, prayed to four STDs and things like that still. Um, at least in Mexico. Which is, you know, the center of the universe in my head. So, uh. <laughs> this does feel like that combines a couple things in terms of uh, to bring it, maybe to bring in Carnelian here. Like the idea that one of the primary things of this fleshly stone is that it stops blood flow. Mm -hmm. And the idea of um, good flow throughout the body versus like stopping bad flow mm -hmm. and, 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 and staunching wounds and, and stopping that which that which seeps out, you know, making sure your insides stay, in, stay inside mm. is interesting to me. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that ties to all sorts of um, uh, impotence law. Mm -hmm. I mean, Catherine Ryder's uh, Magic and Impotence book is, is amazing, not just for looking at, you know, different ways that people have cursed people's willies, but also what that says is a wider thing about... I got it back. Right, right. <laughs> What the wider thing about like it, uh, the the erection being considered a you know a primary sanguine thing, not just because sanguinity is about um, not just joy but also lust, but also that the the air and 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 spiritus of the body is is filling something, and that uh, that's all blood, and that 
uh, you know, prior to a bunch of Paracels and stuff, every disease is is in some way a disease of blood. Mm -hmm. right? That everything comes back to the blood. That the idea of organ failure is kind of new. Organ failure when the blood is doing what it should be doing, as opposed to it failing in that place in the body because uh, something is wrong with the with the blood or with the the humors in the blood. Um, the the sanguine humor being like the plasma of the voluminous vehicle of blood that carries things. And the idea of seed itself being a kind of rarefied blood, as is, you know, milk, as is pretty much every, um, uh, you know, bodily secretion. Mm -hmm. White blood and, and red blood contrasts and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, Carnelian, I find the lore, uh, the, the compatibility with coral is quite interesting. Mm. Coral being uh, a bright red ocean mm -hmm. stone with its own lore everywhere, <laughs> whether it's uh, Medusa blood or... or just the blood of the, the the things that live in the sea, the blood of the dead, even mm -hmm. congealing. Um, the carnelian is the land version in many ways, mm -hmm. and uh, becomes uh, uh, substitutes for each other in many different places around the, the world. Of you don't have coral, but you can have carnelian and probably agate, mm. red agate in some right. form, a reddish agate. Um, to to have this, it's not quite as brilliant as some corals can get. And we even dye our corals to be more red, which then bleeds upon us, which is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, the, the, the cheap dyed coral in some ways echoes the ancient lore more mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. it, it bleeds onto our clothes and our skin. Uh, but the carnelian is a purifier um, and uh, a way of encouraging prosperity, a way of signifying longevity, which coral is oftentimes, a, like in Yoruba culture, is, is immortality. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a... Uh, just the use of coral and its association, the reddening of the flesh, what that means. Uh, certainly, we've talked about this at other times, but like red flesh to me, and because of Basque means naked, um, it's the flesh that is can be reddened. It's it's not covered in clothes. Um, it's, it's Adam and Eve being called red. Yes, exactly, mm. and and ruddy, and, and and of the earth, and what this means, and like because we're talking about dry soil versus wet soil. Mm. So if your if your body is lacking something, it's red. If it's gaining something, it's black, mm. um, which carries over into our stock market terms. Mm. But uh, color theory aside, is its own wonderful fascination for me. Uh, the overlap, interestingly, between that is that red flesh, if you're talking about things that are red colored of the body, is that Ru is also an Eshu in Kimbanda, it's Eshu Ahuda, who is sometimes believed to be the same Eshu as Das Campinas, the Eshu of the meadows or the fields. Um, very strict Eshu, very narrow focus, but it is one of the divine plants that is, or demonic plants, <laughs> to, to something. Um, uh, but the, the plants that are walking as spirits that we can interact with and that can possess people and guide people as their patrons and as patrons of workings or patrons of people. Mm. Um, and I find that, that little thing interesting as well, that a foreign plant becomes in and has to express itself, much like the mango tree, um, mm. uh, in addition to some of the other plants that, that work their way up. Mm. Um, but I do think that the, the, the color magic stuff is salient, and I think you guys have talked about this on the podcast before, the idea that sometimes you have certain rituals or recipes that call for things not necessarily because of their, you know, chemical constituents, but because of their color. Yes. And red in particular in uh, Southern Italy and, and probably other parts of Southern Europe is, uh, it is almost the, the most important color in magic because it has this reputation of being a powerfully protective color. Um, it is the color of the cornicelli, the the little like um, horn amulets that you see, which were traditionally made out of coral. Um, now you find them often in just red plastic, along with the monofico, uh, the the fig hand amulets, um, which have the, it's like the thumb in between the um, middle finger and the pointer finger. Um, and all of these are, are ultimately believed to protect against the evil eye, but you also see in Italian churches oftentimes the votive candles are placed in red containers. Mm -hmm. um, and in the drumming work that I do with my teacher, Alessandra Belloni, the heraldic colors of our work are red and white. So we'll often wear white garb and then, you know, with a red sash. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's a, a little bit in contrast, I think, to, to some traditions where you see that red is a little bit too heating. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more on the dangerous side, even. Mm -hmm. But you're still wearing white with an accent of red, which is interesting, as opposed mm, to yeah. dressing from foot to head like cardinals in red, which is the blood of Christ and its saving power. Or if you go into the four sons of the Congolese belief of the red sun being the son of the living, it is the only sun that the living world actually has by itself. It shares the white and the black sun of the horizon with the world, and the yellow sun belongs to the dead. So it's the color of life. It's reliance <laughs> of, of red flannel, red red cotton, red string in, in conjuring root work, er, echoing the kind of Bantu uh, er, philosophy there, and, and the idea that the enjoyment of life, the Orisha that owns red, Shango, is like his king of this world. Mm. It's um, Letizia, it's the, what we talked about before, like joy, and it's fire, and it's fiery, and it's the color of blood flow only happens while you're alive. Um, the meat turns brown really quickly. Yeah. Um, it's uh, and again, it it calls and it also ennobles the two main uses in in lapidary law for carnelian, precisely because of its redness. Uh, that it purifies the flesh. It stops blood flow, especially uh, tied to. Uh, it's considered very good for um, menstrual problems, mm -hmm. uh, especially. But also that it calms anger, or that it um, it soothes wrath. Right. Mm -hmm. the, so it, 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 it again that thing of like ruling that which it, it is associated with mm -hmm. that it, uh, it it brings to bear. And there are you know there's a wealth of like image magic around um, also pretty martial looking things engraving uh, Carnelian with uh, you know the image of a soldier, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, or a man with a sword. And the expansion from keeping you calm and you know, not bleeding out uh, to a general sense of protection starts to include some um, some more stuff around like protection from um, enchantment or enchant uh, or, or or seduction or mm -hmm. vice, right? So it's the it 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 it, it regulates the um, that which might be considered the um, the infractions of the the red blooded heart. Mm. That's interesting. In the parallels where there's black and red as opposed to white and black things, so pre-Indo-European or East Asian or even uh, Kemetic associations of red-black polarities, um, red becomes associated with focus um, because black is expansive. Mm. So the contracting nature of focusing something, um, lacking, you're focused on what that what you need. If mm. you're lacking food, you the, the other things in life start to be less important <laughs> because you need food. Um, so this idea of the, the reddening of the gaze, the, the seeing red, what that means. And carnelian seems to um, be the, the cooling force of red. Red as mm. a way to stop the bad red flow, meaning uh, both menstrual blood as, as well as blood flow in general, which is interesting just for the... We chose uh, Fortuna Minor mm -hmm. as geomantic and uh, the corresponding Oduazirosun, which literally means menstrual flow, menses, mm -hmm. um, or sounding osun, and which is uh, an orisha of warning, of, of stop and look and pay attention, as well as osun being camwood, which is the red powder that is used as an ashe itself. Um, so it's the, it's the color red, it's a flagging where the, the needs to look both spiritually and physically at your immediate situation and surrounding is very important. Uh, especially if you're going to stay alive. Um, so the paying attention to the things that can bring your downfall, things that make you trip or holes in the ground, don't step over holes, don't don't wear clothing with holes, don't stick your eye in looking in holes, and that the main heraldry of the sign, if you want to say, is an eye itself, and that this is the association of just constantly looking, that mm. you must pay attention, that if the osun, the, the orisha that is received with warriors, uh, is the, the rooster cup with the bells, that if you hear its bells, this is bad. This means something's coming after you. And so similarly with um, how does that tie into menses of, well, there's no child. And it's the thing of blood flow is happening. Make sure first it's not a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Make sure that, that this is normal. And then it's still something else is different for women during this time uh, that men can never understand. And so there's a lot of projection about that and its value as to positive, negative, or its effect on men or the rest of the world. Mm. But the plain fact of the matter is, is that there's no way to understand it for, for men, to go through it, to know what it is like to bleed mm. for several days and have to worry not only about physical self, but the, the other stuff that's out there that is projected upon women for 
having this um, portal to heaven, as as I would like to think of it, mm-hmm. um, as a, as a game man, it's still saying portal to heaven, um, <laughs> because the babies come from in there and the demons. Um, I don't know as much as many ways to connect that to Fortuna Minor. So usually we talk mm-hmm. geomantic figure first and kind of branch off into Odu, but I'm finding all the, the flaggings of <laughs> interesting immensities being talked about and mm-hmm. and paying attention to health mm-hmm. and the warning signs that we have this sign that comes that is resounding, like stop and look and pay attention. Mm-hmm. Like the door handle is hot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just, you know, like we need to to watch that the that, that when rashes happen on the body Mm. stop something's off what did you touch if that's all it was great but like is it a symptom of something else the skin reflects the liver's health especially the filtration systems of the body and the the red parts of the body the tongue the mucous membranes like what happens you can diagnose people's health by tongue in Vedic uh, medicine so it's just all of that is so interesting the overlap there looking at the the symptoms yeah symptoms as 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 not just in order to erase them, but always to treat everything in that holistic way of like, what does this mean? That the that there's a figure that comes that when it falls, four shells in the lagoon is is just. This is where there's prominent female, Arisha energy there, and whether we believe a lagoon is male or female, that it, it, it there's something tied there to this great vastness of the ocean, that is the dead, mm. that is this gravitational descent, <laughs> that the water is held in that way, to. Uh, other prominent forces there of, of remediation. It's female medicine that is needed. It's the and in some ways when we talk about tie it back to household magic, we just talked about mm-hmm. of like something's wrong. Stop doing whatever you're doing and go back and gather your strength at home. Gather your resources and pay attention to quote unquote the the, the things that we normally consider female. You are skipping over it and you are endangering yourself because you are skipping over it. In my Modified opinion, Aido. So this is just how to relate it in that way of you stop. So I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> Fortuna Minor, though. Fortuna Minor. Most of the time, it's talked about as swiftness, as the um, the fortune that comes and goes quickly, easy come, easy go, right? And so, in a way, it is kind of the not the opposite, I don't want to say, but the, the sense of the phenomena might be the same that like, oh, great, you've, you know, uh, don't, don't get complacent about how well things are going. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, could see, I could see that in terms of it. And I was wondering about the, the blood of the sun, right? The sun when it's not at its best, the mm-hmm. sun when it's not a good thing, when you are sunburned from too much sun or, or heat stroke, <laughs> the glowing orb that stands over us. And right, or the, or the or the or the 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 what is it? The burning emperor, in mm-hmm. that uh, in that folk song. Shkalian mm. temperatura. Hmm. Hmm. So. <laughs> that was a great like yeah that's a tie. <laughs> that was a, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I could have just said anything, <laughs> yeah. and I don't think I like, anyone would have known. Prosciutto. Nobody could have called it <laughs> prosciutto. <laughs> <laughs> so Fortuna Minor is like the lesser fortune, but it can also be like the least fortune. It can definitely be the least dark timeline. It's <laughs> the making the fortune. Right, right. Making the most out of a bad could deal. Could have been worse. Right. Could could have been worse. Yeah. It, 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 I it asked says, for money, and all I got was this shiny penny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of settling potentially, but it's mm-hmm. it's definitely the. Why are you doing... It's definitely the one that's like, why are you doing little bits of immediately trying to get money magic rather than building a, a, a wider prosperity? Mm-hmm. And in that sense, it's, but it's also, it's also glitches. It's, it's very much like... Ah, glitches, what do I mean by that? Uh, it, it's the exception. It's exceptional in every sense. So it isn't the, the slow, steady success of Fortuna Major that, that has this kind of bootstrappiness of wanting to do everything itself. It has that sense of, of like the, the accident that uh, is fortunate that you find the $10 on the street after needing it to get your bus home. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it, it's kludging. It gets you there just about, and then it falls apart. Right? It's, the, it's the fortune you need in that moment. And so I think there is a sense of like, I don't know, like if, if you can imagine like it's, 
there's often a thing with geomancy of saying like here's the the good hand and the bad hand of the planet and fortuna major and minor are the solar figures and so the idea of like you can imagine like the sun in retrograde <laughs> it, it, could, it, can, it can be that kind of thing right it can be i say like the sun doing all of that that bad stuff but it's definitely that notion of passing luck that which is like flowing past mm-hmm. and the akhenaten hands of the sun ray are slapping you instead <laughs> yeah. <of> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah instead of like lovingly caressing you. yeah 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 offering you the gold well, the, the sun is, of course, never retrograde, but mm-hmm. at the same time, it, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it does tend to afflict the planets that get too close to it, mm. um, which are either they come under the beams and then become combust and the actual, you know, the orb will be different depending on the astrologer and, mm-hmm. and the, the style of astrology that they've trained in. Um, but that Kazemi is interesting. Yeah. Out of yeah. That. So Kazemi is um, so so you may be aware, you know, twelve signs of the zodiac, and then each one has thirty degrees within it, and then the degrees are further subdivided into sixty minutes. So this is a pretty uh, minute um, uh, <laughs> division of the ecliptic, and Kazemi, I believe, is plus or minus sixteen minutes. From the exact conjunction between the sun and any other planet. And uh, it is said that this is, you know, contrary to being under the beams or combust uh, that is too close to the sun. When you're really in that sweet spot, that like heart of the conjunction, um, that in a way that planet will become kind of supercharged. Um, because it, it, you know, it is merging. If we look at the sun as being kind of like God, um, it, it is merging with God, mm. um, and that's uh, you know a, a volatile magic to play with, and, and something that uh, usually you get a little bit of leeway with planetary elections um, or, or any kind of astrological election. Uh, with Kazemi, no, you better get that one right. <laughs> um, <laughs> pay pay attention to that. So the parallel of that is interesting in that. The suffering of disease, like Saint Rock uh, attains sainthood through this relationship with disease and suffering, mm. and so he goes combust. That life becomes combust, and eventually he is achieving union mm. with the sun, with God, the apotheosis and mm. the chrysopoeia of of that. And the reason he's even found out to be, you know, secretly the lord of the land, he doesn't tell anyone. An angel puts a golden tablet under his dying head, <laughs> a golden tablet, and that's what they read. That's like, oh, turns out he was, you know, uh, the, the call was coming from inside the palace. Uh, which is, a, I don't know, that's, that's, it's, it's like the last paragraph of his thing in the Golden Legend. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So an angel turns up at the beginning to announce that he's going to be born to his, his devout mother. And an angel turns up at the end to announce who he is to, uh, to everyone else that finds his body. And he's in, in uh, southern Italy, the biggest pilgrimage spot for... Uh, San Rocco is Tolve, which is in Potenza, in Basilicata. And uh, one of the... I, I, I don't know, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, but um, because it is so popular, they have a wealth of gold ex votos. And when they take him out for his procession on his feast day, they will build a cape for him that is made out of all of this gold jewelry. So when he goes out, particularly under, you know, the, under the, the Basilicata Sun, um, the less popular sequel to Under the Tuscan Sun, um, this is not the right audience for that joke. That's a, that was a kind of, may you know, it, May it soon be so. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, uh, live, pray, laugh, everyone. Um, that's the message of today's podcast. <laughs> Um, eat, pray, love. Eat, pray, love, live, love, laugh, whatever, you know, white lady bullshit. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> what was I talking about? Tolve. Gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, gun. Oh, my God. That's not what I meant. Gold, Gold. sun, Rocco, cape. Wow. Yeah. Gun. Really, really <laughs> awesome cape that he is paraded in. And because he's under the, you know, the strong mezzogiorno sun, uh, mm. it looks like he's glowing. It looks like he's this kind of second sun, which is out and walking around on the earth. Mm. Um, and I found some really lovely kind of like late 90s, early 2000s animated gifs <laughs> um, on the uh, St. Rocco Society website that reflect this, um, yeah, what it, what it looks like, um, as an, as an impressionist moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's, he's 
cool in that way. Yeah. I have this other angle on Fortuna Minor that I'm interested to, to see if there are, there are parallels here, which is like the sun not in the sky being great and the Fortuna Major of you slowly, um, you know, accruing your, your fortune, but the sun entering the underworld. Because there is a lot of stuff around Fortuna Minor feeling like a figure of, of coasting, of like mooching, of getting by, but moreover of being involved in like underworld or underhanded things of like the, the 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 bad fortune in the sense of like the fortune that's precarious because it's not necessarily exactly super legal uh, for instance and so this idea of like uh, this you know fortuna minor having this quality of the demi of like oh. of not walking through hell in terms of uh, a catabasis of of achieving something and then coming back mm. or of resurrection mm. but of like being in the half world of, of, of operating in the shadows to an extent. That ill-gotten gains are still gains, mm-hmm. but they can disappear very, very quickly. Right, 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 right. Yeah. That, uh, then you have the, not only just entering the underworld, which would be the west, but the entire journey of the sun through the underworld, that the stirrings on of the dead still need more effort to mm-hmm. manifest for the living mm-hmm. than actions directly taken in our world. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the need to stop, look and listen, and figure out how to bring those things to fruition yeah. is the blood must go into the soil and the soil must produce fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, is interesting. I think there's also a thing around Fortuna Minor being, I was saying it's like exceptional in every sense. Uh, there's also a sense of it working the loopholes and things of understanding that the exception I think mm-hmm. about how um, Richard Feynman talked about how physics was um, uh, like working out the rules to a game as you're playing it. And he says, you know, he gives this example of, of castling in chess, where like you're playing it, and then all of a sudden, like these two pieces do something super weird. They like swap places, and they can only do it once in a game, but that's still part of the rules, but it seems totally not part of the rules. Mm-hmm. But you've just learned more about the process of, of playing the game. And Fortuna Minor. Uh, when it when it when it falls often seems to connote that sense of of playing the game well of like social engineering. Hmm. And I don't know how that fits with the idea of of the opposite of like paying a, a attention to a warning sign. Well, I mean the the, the proverb associated with the ocean of no one knows like what lies at the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. So when I mean, we're talking the sun in the underworld, the ocean is the underworld. There's this there's this notion of it's mystery. Hmm. There is mystery here, so you have to stop and look. Mm. And so part of that, if you receive a small check, you might think, oh, this is wonderful. Like, I'm doing really good. And the, and the thought of, are you? Are you though? <laughs> like, don't just spend all that. Like, mm. you know, more might not be coming. Mm. We need to, to, to pay attention to resources, which in a famine side is, is telling as well. But, the, right? but that at the bottom of the ocean, you also find creatures that make their own light. Yes. The phenomenon of bioluminescence. And that, you know, it, it gets back to me, for me, to that demi monde idea that, you know, among whatever, you know, group of people that you may fall in with, you will still find potentially, you know, redeeming characteristics and fortunes and, uh, you know, alternative views of, um, I don't know what it, what it means to shine in this world. Mm. The, the, you know, the virtues of the criminal underworld. Mm. They're still there. They're just very, very different from what we're used to mm-hmm. here as land dwellers. Which I think is a good parallel to, I mean, if we're talking ocean in West African belief and nobody knows what lies there, the sun is still going there. So mm-hmm. it's lighting the underworld of the dead where, during our nighttime. So there is an immediate connection of our nighttime to the activity of the dead because that's when they're awake. Mm-hmm. The sun is in their world. Mm-hmm. So they're, the rules, they're still there and the light is still there, but they operate on different rules. Left is right, right is left, up is down, down is up. And it's, it's a little bit of the fairyland side of it, of not quite sure what things are, but if we take it into Irosun of being stop, look, and listen, and Fortuna Minor there of like, you've been given this food. Did a fairy give it to you? <laughs> and are you going to be trapped in another right. world? Does this come with loopholes? Does it come with strings attached? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. But, but, but also to know that as these are signs that can fall does not mean that they have always are always falling. So... Because if you're someone that's constantly is seeing the bad side of this, this can bring up a paranoia. This can bring up the the, the bad uh, bad pot puff of just worrying yeah. that everything is chasing you. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's definitely something else that it it seems Fortuna Minor is about, which is you know the the kind of happy go lucky devil may care attitude of 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 never quite making the full success of Fortuna Major, but definitely being like lucky, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and and a luck that doesn't ever necessarily put you in uh, a, a secure place ever, but you know will help you coast if you want to turn up to your nine to five job and just get ignored enough to be able to work on your novel or or just you know, dick about on the internet, mm -hmm. right? That kind of low level invisibility of the sun, not of, uh, of being so invisible that you get fired because no one knows what you do, but, <laughs> but just not noticed enough, just slightly, you know, boss fixed uh, enough to, to not be burdened with big projects mm -hmm. or not expected uh, to do too much. Pictographically, what is this supposed to evoke? Because it looks like an up upside down. It is the upside down version of Fortuna Major, but mm -hmm. the the idea of it, it, it could it be a a vault with a pole, or is it an upside down thing? Whereas if we take it as filled, if it is empty in Fortuna Minor, when it's upright, it's really freaking precarious. It's like balancing. It's like spinning a cup on a a, a pole. It's spinning mm. a plate. The Fortuna Major side of it, like great fortune, doesn't come that often. Mm. Um, but this sign can fall just like any of the others. Like what is that? That's just interesting. So pictographically, it's uh, one one two two yeah. right, at Fortuna Minor one dot one dot two dots two dots. And that's top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, not the Australian way of. Sometimes said to be a flag on Under a hill. Under the ocean way, sorry. A flag on a pole. So okay, flag on a pole makes sense. Um, I like uh, the idea of it being a bell. Uh, that's something that uh, ah, someone said before. Yeah, so there we go. There's our parallel. Uh, in contrast, uh, I think John Michael Greer says that Fortuna Major two two. One one is a river flowing between a uh, valley, and that he has all this stuff around Fortuna Major proper success being that like riding the synchronicity highway of like being the river that flows through and that brings gain and um, not in a acquisitio way but in a in the sense of, uh, of 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 being in alignment with your own um, you know path and, and and the world and destiny and I like that notion of uh, Fortuna Major in that case as a tuning fork. Mm -hmm. Of like uh, your um, a different kind of resounding, I suppose that you're you're, you're harmonizing. Uh, whereas that means for tuna minor, then is the the tuning fork stuck in the ground. Um, it's the upside down. It's it's I don't know. It's resonating with the with the earth rather than the sky. Hmm. It's getting by uh, in in the, in the the world of the worldly, hmm. as opposed to calling down greater favors from from heaven. Interesting. Calling down greater powers from heaven, calling up greater powers from hell. Because mm -hmm. um, we got... Uh, people bemoaned are not actually getting to demons a couple episodes <laughs> ago. So, um, I will not pronounce his name because I believe it has a horrible power over me, but simply because I do not understand how to pronounce it. Um, <laughs> uh, Fructose is his name, is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> he does have a power over you. He does, he does right now. Yeah. He does, it's true. Fructose would be better for the other one, uh, Fructimie, because that's the, the spirit of banquets and, and feasts. Um, what I say is Fructissier, which, which might be entirely wrong because I don't have any French, and it's probably from there, uh, concerns the exchanging... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was Al making that dumb French laugh. It was not. You are stereotypically doing this in a way. <laughs> we've, we've still not got over Agincourt. Um <laughs> The main role of uh, Fricissier is to exchange oh, the places. Really? <laughs> I've been reading a lot of those French Elon Musk tweets. Uh, Elon like Musk. I like the Swedish chef ones. Elon Musk. <laughs> pork, pork. Okay. Sorry, go on. No, it's, 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 <laughs> his demon will not be eschewed. Damn it, go. Exchanges the place of the living and the dead, is what's often said. Now, Exchanges is quite interesting. Yeah. Now, that, that, that's <laughs> also sometimes... Possession? Translated, right. That's Swingers. also sometimes translated as uh, bringing uh, any, uh, the dead to the living. Um, and sometimes manuscript forms have it as bringing the dead to the living and the living to the dead. So there's also that potential for, like, the serious expedition curse work of, of, of sending someone to their grave, potentially. There are also sometimes... Um, references to the wealth of the dead. Um, in terms of the older manuscript that uh, I've been, you know, citing more often now since um, since its JHP, 
published uh, Secrets of Solomon in the, the earlier uh, CSDS, the uh, Clavicula Solomonis de Secretis. Your acronyms uh, have no power here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Fruthiel in that case, and will bring you anyone living or dead, such as when Cicero once argued his Milo declamation and assisted Caesar. And um, uh, Joe Peterson, uh, Joseph H. Peterson, uh, makes a point that this is interesting because it's a specific reference and shows that there's an there's an actual classical illusion going on here that like mm-hmm. they're, 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 that might say something about the education of the, the person reading it. In the subject of exchanges, I just think it's funny because you clarify Joseph H. Peterson and we have a friend whose name is Joseph Peterson who often gets mistaken for Joseph H. Peterson. And, and he's always so uh, magnanimous when people try and uh, praise him for books he didn't write. Yes. Um, I recently did a friends list purge on Facebook, and I'm friends with like four Joseph Petersons. <laughs> it's it's crazy out there, guys. Watch out for those Joseph Petersons. That's right. The H in there, like Jesus, you can trust him. Um, his uh, the, the exchange of the living and the dead I find interesting with notions of disease mm-hmm. and what that is because it, his corresponding Eshu is Eshu the Cemetery, who's the Eshu the Cemetery. It's a very mm-hmm. straightforward name, Mister of the Cemetery. <laughs> So, um, not particularly a nice Eshuwe reputation. He is considered Black Death, Ebola, Plague, Eshu. So there's, it is, because he is a cemetery Eshu, he is an, an, an Omolu mm. of the Legion of Death in Kimbanda, which is tied, of course, to the plague god Babaluai Ge Omolu, Shakpata, Shakpona. Um, but that, uh, I believe, uh, there's more than one comparison to him of saying that like a Mengele type character is Eshigo Cemetery. Hmm. So the 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 Nazi doctor who experiments on children hmm. and that needles are sacred to him and poisonous plants, poisonous animals, the threat, the long drawn out torture through sickness, whether it's been given to the person or it's naturally se- selected, quote unquote, is there a natural selection of disease? Who knows? Get the um, spider working. Yeah, one of them. That is that is the severing the tarantula and putting the snake skin and all that other stuff in it. Yes, mm-hmm. um, a large one. Mm. Um, but uh, although, in truth, it's I believe it's actually the armadeira that is associated with him, which is the one of the most toxic spiders in the world. It's a large spider that looks almost like a wolf spider, but it also warns you. Speaking of warning, it has two little red patches or orange patches under its legs, and it looks like it's trying to land an airplane when you come near it. It's like, no, go somewhere else. Don't come near me because I will kill you. <laughs> and then all, most people die from it only when they're putting on a shoe and they haven't shaken out their boots mm-hmm. because adults are like, I don't want to die. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to bite you. I don't want to get shook because I'm going to bite. And the, even if I kill it eventually, it's still going to try and bat me. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's usually juveniles and when you don't shake out your shoes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it is... Um, the story of that, of, of trying to see them because they, they happen during mating season in Brazil and we happen to be there, a few of us, and, and trying to look for them for and look for them outdoors and outdoors and seeing other things. You're like, no, that's a garden spider. No, that's just enough. That when it bites you, you only get sick for a little bit. You'll be fine four days from now. And it's like, oh God, that's a garden spider? Um, and then like my last night there watching TV and looking down my friend's hallway and seeing this hand moving. I was like, I think that's it. And... Uh, confirms like yeah this is an armadena mm-hmm. and like my friend going up to him like oh I want to get it because I want to you know put it in a jar and he baps it with a sandal and being told huh, you're very brave because they can jump three feet <laughs> 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 but it is it is it is the armadena the armed one um, mm. but this this association with those cemetery oh, lots of spiders have associations uh, with with Kimbanda spirits but um, he is not an easy one he's one that that cleansings must be happening afterwards it is the twisted doctor mm. the doctor that's giving you diseases which is interesting because it's t- it's a perverted form of inoculation mm. mm-hmm. and inoculation when we're talking earlier about like a little bit of the disease is a good thing mm-hmm. that we bring the disease deified into our life and so we bring a saint who's been knowing plague mm-hmm. into our lives to hopefully inoculate us against the plague yeah we mm. bring we bring Babaloya uh, Sohano Omolu into the, our lives as a figure of, of petition uh, to hopefully placate that he doesn't get too heated and bring disease, but also that it's like a little bit inoculation and, and the, the priests of Babaloya themselves actually taking, cutting their skin and putting the smallpox scabs of dead people into their skin to build up immunity, mm-hmm. which is also interesting because smallpox uh, was, a, it was another thing that Jeremy scared me with of, of uh, at the Virginia United previously mentioned of uh, 
just how scary the diseases are that are stored in like a place like Galveston, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and all kinds. Yeah, that that when that hurricane was going back like last year, how how scary it was of like. So 95% of the world's deadliest diseases are on this one little island that is now being threatened by a hurricane. And, like, <laughs> if it gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. But there is extreme safety because they obviously mm -hmm. things like go deep into the ground and hide and, like, can't be destroyed by water. But it's still, like, it's intense of, like, how many pairs of gloves do you, can you handle this one with? Mm -hmm. and, and the notion of disease. So it's just, there's a lot of this talk within Kimbanda of it being... Uh, difficult, uh, difficult to handle, difficult to be around, mm -hmm. and it does heat, and it does bring certain energies, and, and learning to clean and cleanse oneself when working with these spirits is incredibly important, which ties back in some ways to the work with Rue, with Santisma Muerte, who is you, the older traditions of using a paro, of, of having a saint or a grounding or something that pulls you back from the world of the dead, or in Kimbala to have the Mayaral, this, this, this ray of light that can go into darkness, mm -hmm. the sun going into the bottom of the ocean, or, or what is your light, what do you take with you, mm -hmm. becomes really interesting to me. Not for the sake of, do you have to balance everything out? Well, technically no, but the, the, it's the thought of, you know, the big bad necromancers out there that like, so did you want to make love to the pile of bones, like the conflation of necrophilia and necromancy. That, <laughs> that, uh, but the idea here of sweet things are nice too, on occasion. The, the, the bitter can be balanced with sweet, the sweet can be balanced with bitter. They both help define each other. But that what pulls you back to yourself? Mm -hmm. That you can get lost in the ecstasy of a person, uh, a, a substance, food, uh, a performance, dancing, the weather. Yeah whatever it is, but what pulls you back to yourself and, and how much time do we spend on that centering hmm. notion? Yeah, and that you might watch, you know, a movie in the Saw franchise, for example, or some other kind of extreme cinematic representation of body horror or violence or other disturbing themes, but that movie ends and when it's over, the, the wave of relief, the catharsis that happens as a result of watching that type of material is probably what most people are looking for, not the, you know, not the actual, uh, you know, to, to live in that space of just blood and guts all the time. The sun sets and rises and therefore is tolerable. The, play, the, the golden brat plague god that floats over us that was drawn <laughs> with sunglasses by children. Yeah. Um, uh, Mallory was pointing out early how strange that was. Um, uh, but that the sun is noted through its cycles, and that's interesting too, that the constant exposure to the sun would be a different thing. That the enjoyment of it, or the enjoyment of the night, comes from the, the non-oppositional dualism, just I'm gonna keep pushing that mm -hmm. uh, side of it. Um, again, because of the disease side. Uh, like, disease is not necessarily the antidote itself. Disease is disease. It, it's there's is, is it that it's taking it away or is that it's becoming like when you get inoculated you're not taking the disease away you're actually introducing it into your body and become and having power over it by introducing it into yourself mm -hmm. so you're not you haven't eradicated it but it does eradicate the power of the disease in some ways it's weird mm -hmm. you have developed a certain antibody that corresponds to that disease and thus in a way that disease has kind of become a part of you yeah it is you know there's a reflection of it within you that's very interesting. I, the, there's a number of therapies with uh, diseases, uh, alternative therapies, of uh, actually going in and trying to make friends with your viruses and your, mm. your bacteria that are in you of like, if I die, you die too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that notion. And there's uh, a lot of people I know have, have found a certain piece of that. Other people think like that's way more frustration of like feeling like I'm failing at something when that doesn't work. But mm. um, I don't know. There's something interesting in all of that of the rock, the rockifying, the rockification of it. Of this is this is the deck I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I've got to find a way to make this work. And that there are ways that disease and disability can give rise to greater creativity, and and you know you're able to forge uh, new new styles, new ideas. Um, my favorite example of that being who is it? The bassist for Black Sabbath. Who uh, the guitarist? The guitarist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who uh, lost his fingers in an industrial accident, or, or parts of them, the tips of them, and had to learn how to play his instrument in a way that nobody had ever played it before, 
yeah. and fashioned the, himself leather uh, f- like finger added things and there's also some ideas some guitarists might disagree about power chords uh, uh, de- uh, drop detuning meaning that you can bar uh, the, th- the top bottom three strings and produce power chords in a much more simple way and play things like da 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 Iron Man etc thank you thank you I should be performing nightly so okay but yeah it's interesting balance there right of like to to there are people also who seek out disease Mm. and exposure to things is it inoculation? Is it hoping for what that is? There's this notion is is uh, a difficult discussion for me, for many because of that side of it of like there's a difference between um, making your own story self mythologizing and trying to find a way to to, to set your myth up myth up for the best mm. you that you can come out in the end of mm. um, versus uh, those who might uh, seek out. Uh, through contagion, through experience, mm. um, risk-taking behavior, uh, whatever it is, and, and, and that side of it is interesting too, which would in many ways be said to be under the province of an issue like Dos mm. of, um, you know, if death brings you closer to, to, if momento mori brings you closer to d- divinity in some way, and if mastery and genius are, are a quality of that, then what happens when you willing to introduce yourself to those things if you take the kind of tantric approach of engaging the forbidden substances in order to find a release from the taboo itself and therefore freedom but when does that become risk-taking behavior right well there's a teleology there right at what point are you smoking and drinking because that brings you that's a medium by which you can get closer to a set of spirits and at what point are you using the excuse of I'm using this to get close to spirits or even developing a crutch Mm -hmm. of needing it to see spirits as a you know uh, so yeah I think there is a a teleology there right are you is the is the point the risk taking or is the point that you now recognize that disease you now recognize that um, that pattern of abuse getting um, uh, you know child protection training Um, they you know anyone that you talk to or anyone that I talk to afterwards said, you know, there will be a month after they they teach you certain um, signs of potential uh, abuse that you will second guess every encounter in public with every, you know, child and carer. Like, there'll be a little part of your brain that's installed there going like, but what if that's not their kid? What if, like, something else is going on? And that that notion of um, spending hours talking about horrible things so that you know how to spot them and hopefully, you know, um, provide uh, services or at least call someone up who can provide services to help in some mm. way. Um, that we, again, we're, I, I don't want to just end, end on that, that truism of knowing how to hurt is, is knowing how to heal, but I think there is something of that there. Mm. With the nature of, of the hurt and healing. Um, you just made me think of the the fact that the at least the Rider Waite version of the Sun card is a as an infant riding a, a white horse. Mm. And uh, is sometimes referred to as conquest, but other times pestilence. Mm. Of the four horses of the apocalypse. Right? The white the, the Oh wow. behold a pale horse. I just realized I was like I'd never put that that the baby's riding a white horse specifically, and then be like, okay, if that's one of the four, then that's conquest or pestilence. So that's an interesting, and disease being the owner of the world or the co-owner of the world along with death, in many ways in, 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 in Orisha, like this is the, the Ajo Gundir, the leaders of the rest, death and disease. Um, death is not necessarily our enemy, but disease definitely pushes. Hmm. And how can we use it for divine, for, for not for, hmm. um, for divine, Revelation and and advantage to ourselves, but um, <laughs> speaking of advantage to ourselves, how can we use disease to advantage, ad- advantageous to ourselves? Four thieves. So the lore of the four thieves there, of using disease, to have material gain. Right, right, uh, and also using the knowledge of, so that 
the myth goes, as I'm sure many will already, already be familiar, that four thieves are wandering around some point between the 13th and 18th centuries, mm -hmm. because one of the things about plague is that it has that quality of um, a, a, a plague story. It is it, happening. Yeah, it is really again. transferable to mm -hmm. a to to a particular time, but it, it is transferable to another particular time as well. Some point during a plague, which occur in these waves anyway, uh, across time. Uh, four thieves are either robbing the dead or are going to um, the places that have been abandoned because so many people have died from plague and are using a particular formulary to avoid um, catching the plague and thus are benefiting from it. And what I find interesting is that they even benefit from the formulary when they are caught in many of these stories and their sentence is lessened uh, if they give away the secret of their... Uh, of their protection. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I find the was it the notion of vinegar itself, right? So mm -hmm. is a is a common way to distill or to not to, distill, to to take herbs, uh, the the sulfur of the herb into the medicine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and instead of using alcohol directly, but vinegar's relationship to plague, the plague stones that were uh, often places of uh, outside the market where people who had, who were lepers or were victims of the plague could still buy and sell things for daily life. And that the, uh, sometimes there was, it was a bald stone, meaning there was no cross on it anymore. Um, so uh, often called vinegar stones in England, I believe, hmm. uh, which is just the, the notion of vinegar as a medicine. Hmm. Um, that the, the, the washing rituals of water that would happen at the foot of a cross, hmm. uh, speaking of and Crusado and all these other things, um, but replacing that with vinegar and, and what that means. Um, the notion of Christ drinking vinegar, which is a, a thing for dehydration. Oh, really? In general, that, um, like switchel is a common drink when you're when doing the hay harvest. If you drink a lot of water, you're just going to sweat it out, but vinegar hydrates you and keeps you hydrated. Um, oh, so, it's a mercy. Yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, uh, it, it was so always taught to us as like, look how terrible these soldiers are. To, uh, you know, no, giving, drink giving vinegar. vinegar is when you are when you are pouring sweat. Vinegar is what you drink. Mm. Uh, but many people don't drink vinegar anymore. Like, but it's mm. because wine, when it goes bad, you're going to do something with it. And the mother of vinegar has many uses alchemically, mm -hmm. right? Mm. So there's that. That is a, 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 when the vinegar mother shows up. Like, keep that mama, keep her happy. <laughs> but the I don't know. I just the the, the four thieves. The, the the idea that this mythology has been created around this thing because certainly like which four thieves why mm -hmm. and and how and which country are they from is it is it truly french is it english is it english is it italian mm -hmm. what is it and the idea that it might be f um fourth rave or fourth like an english surname that oh yeah early yeah and that it, it becomes a an evolution of this corrupted last name um and therefore stories must like we talked about before like saints sh stories should evolve in some ways to fit the, fit the needs of the people mm -hmm. at the time like mm -hmm. it's helpful to have like okay say you know for it brings communion and this sustains them because there's now a mystery in there that is helpful for someone and someone who has dogs is going to have a devotion to this saint that isn't possible when that dog is taken out of the story mm -hmm. um and and here four thieves becomes this thing of like almost the hand of glory but in a different way um and, and for Thebes, vinegar, to be clear, it's not one recipe. It's, it's kind of a family of, of recipes. And I think commonly you'll find that there are uh, four herbs that are focused on in the recipe. And I've got a couple of them here. Um, one with rosemary, sage, lavender, and rue, who was featured earlier, mm -hmm. um, which is coming to us from a 1910 copy of the Scientific American Encyclopedia of Receipts, Notes, and Quarries. Um, and another version I've got here includes wormwood, meadowsweet, wild marjoram, and sage. Um, and then uh, Lucky Mojo has a recipe that seems to be a bit of an outlier, um, which is uh, garlic, cayenne pepper, and black pepper along with other herbs and essences. Um, but I think the, the commonality here is often these are aromatic herbs. Um, often with, you know, antiseptic qualities or, or, you know, which would be good against either the pestilence itself or the carriers of that pestilence, uh, the fleas, mm. the insects, the, the things that might be bringing it to you. Yeah, there are definitely like, uh, you know, the use of wormwood to, to ward off worms and another 
uh, insects and, and, and pests and things. The, the use of pepper and cayenne, black pepper and cayenne, sort of speaks to the again the underworldish quality of this is this is thief magic this is yeah. you know this is this is doing something dodgy uh, magic i also like the idea in terms of that again that demimond thing of um, a one recipe i encountered specified fresh roux so mm-hmm. we're talking about using fresh versus dried and dried sage and the idea of using that which is alive and that which is kind of dead right and combining the two and walking between the worlds of the living and the dead and being able to do so safely. Mm. So I like that quality of it. It's also the the notion of putting anything fresh into an herbal concoction is always a risk, right? Because the contaminants of water um, uh, brings fungus. And rue is a fungicide. I mean, like there's things don't grow in the solution where rue is. Um, uh, it, the heavy reliance on camphor in some of the recipes mm. And which dissolves completely um, if it's done right, but the certainly the the later recipes by the time you get to the 30s, it basically seems like everybody collected anything called Four Thieves and threw everything in one jar. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it wasn't just the fire cider; it was here's these things that work. And by and the the myth is that by not by drinking it, but by dabbing it on certain places of the body, which were where buboes appeared, so lymph nodes. So behind the ears, Hands, ears the wrists, temples, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the crotches of the body are a common thing. Mm-hmm. So heavy pulse points, um, not just uh, crotches of the body, uh, it's really, it's under the arms thing, as well, right? yeah. which is something. So it's, like, it's not just like a, a crotch of the stick is not necessarily where the genitals are. Just all of your crotches. Yeah, all of your crotches. The Golden Legend specifies that some of the first um, buboses yes. uh, that, uh, that St. Rock gets aren't, aren't the leg, are under the arms. It is, well, this is the common places, right? So where there's common blood flow and heat mm. um, and skin rubbing against itself. Mm. Uh, all those things contribute to first things, but the protecting, so the, the, the arteries are close to the surface of the skin. Underneath, the reddening happens underneath the protected parts, the back of the knee, under the armpits, the wrist, these things that are normally not just exposed all the time. Mm. Um, so it's interesting. Um, which are also the places that you're often instructed to apply perfume. Yes, because of the Back of the, the knees, heat. the back of the wrists, the elbows, inner elbows. And then I, I don't hear armpits that often, but of course, most many people apply deodorant there, mm-hmm. which is its own kind of perfume. So it kind of gets Pulse us back points. to... Yeah. Yeah. Back to the relationship between scent and spirits and disease. Yeah, I, I, I caught a stray mention, there were no details of it, that there was an Italian version of um, uh, Seven Thieves vinegar as well, that was apparently sold as a smelling salt. And so that idea again of like scent, I couldn't mm. find any more details about it, but uh, that idea of, yeah, again, applying um, miasma and, and what is, what is, what is, what has to be breathed in. You don't have to look at a thing. You can even, you know, cover your ears, but like you have to be breathing. Mm-hmm. Well, the notion of, of vapors and what they are in general, the, yeah. the, the things flying through the air that we talked about a little bit, but like even the mention of, of, of Nola here, right? Of <laughs> the, the, the swamp itself and this, the smells associated with the swamp are very different from high ground. Mm. Um, high ground considered, quote unquote, holy and bogs and swamps. Powerful places, rarely viewed as holy. Holy has to be installed there. So there's a difference there that like the, in some areas that like if there's no cemetery, bury them high up on a mountain because they're closer to God and it's okay. But criminals and everybody else are put in the bog. Mm. You know, this is, this is a, it's a, it's a place of contagion, which mm. is true from the moisture and the heat possibly, or the different gases that are there. But it's a... In, in more U- Northern European countries, the bog is also that which remembers as well. Like that's where we get the bog man. That's where we get perfect mm. preservation of things. Wow. Um, that's how we know the faces of uh, the, uh, of, the of, of, of our ancestors, right? Because uh, they were, they were preserved there, and they're also you know the so it, some of them are foreigners sometimes too, which is interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. super interesting. Sacrifices are foreign, right? And the people are, 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 are traveling wider and wider than we give credit for. Very often, we keep that's finding so earlier examples of trade routes and stuff. It's also to to return to to thieves uh, and and the. I guess the the thieves and and the guilty. You know, there's plenty of Irish folklore about the the bog being that which gives up uh, the body at a particular point that uh, the the son who has usurped 
um, the the uncle or or killed the father and inherited and claimed it was you know claimed it was the foreigner mm -hmm. is the 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 bog is also that which doesn't just remember but like presents the evidence mm -hmm. and accuses. It's interesting. It reminds me of the Saint Agatha's Day using the candle with the bread to find the drowned body type of thing that if you're still looking hmm. and you haven't found it yet that this is one way to do it is on her day it's like that's a long time to wait but you know hmm. not going into the dirty lake water yourself makes sense hmm. Hmm. Uh, but the, the bread will overturn at the right place where the prayers are said huh. um, the candle is pointing down where's that found? Uh, Pyrenees oh. northern Spain Basque country Asturias Galicia seems to have a similar but the cult of Agatha there is the a kind of replacement for breed in many ways. So the candlemas lore that you would find in British world of Brigantia and breed is very much placed onto Agatha in mm -hmm. the in the Pyrenees and that part of Spain. Um, Agatha Dolina, Santa Agatha. But the um, it's all very interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think uh, Al supposedly has to go teach something he's doing for <laughs> some stupid company. Um, uh, but he's going to do right by his students and go teach uh, a class. Absolutely. So um, just uh, thank you uh, to our first ever guest, Mari, uh, and uh, who uh, Al has the unique privilege and... Uh, uh, honor honor delight yes of being married to keep going yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you uh, both for making the time to record uh, and uh, so how do we tie this all together as a final blessing mm. <laughs> um, wear sunscreen <laughs> the sun's mean yep um, check your armpits mm -hmm. for fleas and buboes mm-hmm um, Make sure that your mirrored sunglasses don't have the mirrors on the inside. Yeah. Um, and when someone shows you their ass, believe them. <laughs> so that's really helpful advice, right? Mm -hmm. But that, that when we have warning signs, often we skirt past them. Mm. Mm. And I think there's something about the, 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 the wonderful small blessing that is warning signs and listening to our intuition of something's wrong here. Mm. Um, whether it's in the body or in the environment or in, in the world and that um, we should allow for joy in our lives that we should, we should make joyous uh, life out of whatever it is that we are handed but at the same time to listen to the little alarms that go off and believe yourself uh, mm. use the power of, of purgatives and, and rue and um, let all your misfortunes be miscarried mm. um, in that way. Uh, may, so may the the red in your life not be the, the rosy tinted glasses of thinking that small victories will be everlasting but be the, the red flag to the bull of your determination mm -hmm. that you flag at it and that allows you to bridle your rage to do something useful and constructive with. And I think also just with St. Rock with the festivals as you both experienced and what you talked about being such an old festival that the, the St. Lore and this reliance on looking into what has come before is itself a way of honoring ancestry honoring mm -hmm. um, what is it that, that you both said to me of the the democracy of the dead. <laughs> that, that this is the this is the the way that we are all still a community. That tradition informs the living in this way and perpetuates, and we are not stuck reinventing the wheel. <laughs> that we are f able to derive meaning from what has been handed to us, and reject, inform, elaborate, make more relevant, make less relevant. But the ignorance of it. Uh, doesn't seem to help us any. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, Saint Rock, San Rocco, San Roque. I'll let you pronounce it in the Italian way. <laughs> uh, he's uh, he's a damn sexy saint in many ways, and uh, a happy feast of Saint Rock to you all. And uh, yeah, 
Y viva Santi Rocco. Viva Santa Rocco. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And uh, until next time. Stay sunny. <laughs> Keep those sunglasses on, sun children. All right. <laughs> We're going to end with a little uh, song for Sun Rock. Pizza in the mouth. <laughs> Why would you do this to me? Because this is how it, it's capturing real life. It is. <laughs> what is the song? My mouth is full of pizza, you asshole. <laughs> So, um, so this song <laughs> is, uh, in, uh, the Basilicata language, um, and it is a song which is very popular among the pilgrims who are primarily coming from other parts in southern Italy, but some of them come from, um, the north or from other, other European countries as well, um, and it will be stuck in your head for the rest of your life. So, um, if you continue listening, be ready for that commitment. Um, but it's also really great, really great because the, um, the chorus is just, Iviva Santi Raka, Ca Santi Raka Iviva, Iviva Santi Raka, Ca Inta Tolvestai. Um, so if you want to have a small devotion to him and you just put the song on, you can sing along with that chorus and you can also switch that word Tolve out for whatever, you know, city you live in. Um, because the exact translation is, you know, uh, long live Saint Rock, uh, long live Saint Rock, long live Saint Rock, uh, and dwell within Tolve. Um, so you'd be saying, you know, Kainta Tol, uh, into New York Stye, for example. All right, so here we go. pizza now <laughs> let no man put apart what pizza has joined please go back to your pizza and your wine thank you okay
Grazie mille. Prego. 